Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the left. left to the right. Yes, mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll put this in the video. <laughs> I mean, wow. You have to. You have to. Hey everybody, hey. so it is Tuesday the 21st of April. We are on day number 36 of self-isolation in Tallinn, Estonia. Go and shop. <laughs> <laughs> we are just on our way into the old town centre. A few weeks ago we got chatting to the lady who manages um, the tourist information centre. She said to us that uh, a lot of the tour guides who give free tours around Tallinn are currently not doing anything and as long as we stick to uh, self-isolation rules and are sensible um, we can have a tour of the city so we've booked it in for today because it's a bit warmer it's a high tea 12 degrees <laughs> <laughs> it's so warm we've actually taken our coats off <laughs> we're just heading into the center to meet our guide Coit and we're going to have a guided tour of the city. Some yeah. things are slowly starting to open up now. We noticed the yeah. photography museum is open. There's a couple of shops here that yeah, are open. Yeah, and there's this well. like uh, fitness place that we walk past every day near to our accommodation. And that's now open this morning. It's the first time I've noticed that open. So we're like, yeah. yay, starting to get excited. Yeah. Perhaps the world is... Slowly coming. <laughs> I don't want to say it, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, opening up, yeah. <laughs> We were due to be getting the ferry from here across to Helsinki. Yeah. Uh, Three days turned into 36 so far. Alrighty. And we just extended now again to the 17th of... Where are we? Eight, eight, eight. 17th of May. May. Yeah. Or no, so oh, yeah, May, yeah. 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 So it's going to be two yeah. months at least. But you're getting by well? Love this city. We're in Teleskivi. Ah, Teleskivi. So, but just to give you a, a perspective, it was a, a, a dirty, uh, long forgotten industrial district that yes. nobody liked. Sure. Yeah. Crime. Uh, you, wanna yeah. go, you go there, you come out with de 10 different sicknesses and illnesses, you know, right. like this. <laughs> and finally, the city realized this is also part of our city. Yeah. And so the city yeah. started booming, and now we're uh, uh, fixing up the, let's say, the, the most distant parts as well. On the peninsula? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. New houses, uh, new venues. There. This is yeah. what we like about being here, because obviously the beauty of us staying longer means that we've had time to just stroll around. And mm -hmm. There's so many different aspects to Tallinn, because you've got the old town, and then you've got like the, the sort of shopping area, and then you've got Teleskivi, which is just so cool. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, Every yeah. Crowd. Everything <laughs> happens for a reason. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 Let's start with the show. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like <laughs> to paint you the picture. Uh, because I'm excited to hear the stories again myself as yeah, well. Yeah. And anything else that comes up to your mind. Raise your hand, raise okay. your voice, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This will be a whole narrative, a binding narrative from the start yeah. to the very end. Okay. And the very start, it takes us to the end of the 1100s. Okay. And this is a time when the Christian Empire was broadening its borders. And the Pope, he has sent missionaries here to the north to Christianize these last remaining pagans of Europe. Now, Soon enough, everybody realizes, even the Pope, that uh, these pagans, they don't want to hear anything about the church. <laughs> so this mission is a failure. So the Pope, they, he decides that a proper crusade must be had. So he calls upon whoever wants to crusade these lands, and the first ones who answer are the Danes and the Germans. And the first ones who come here in the year 1219 are the Danes. The Danes, they go up there, and after a bloody battle, they conquer the hill and claim these lands as their own. So in 1219, this city gets its official beginning. Now, as the Danes, they settle themselves in there for about 10 years, it is now the time for the Germans, who have come from the south, Christianizing and conquering their way up north, to arrive here. But the first thing they see, they see the Danish flag waving. They see the Danish fortress rising. And they see that these lands are in Danish hands. Now, the Germans, they haven't come here to go back home empty-handed. They're here with a whole army. They want a piece of this territory, yeah? But since they both represent Christianity, fighting amongst each other is of course out of the question. So what do the Germans do? They come up with a very clever plan, which to take to the king, as to uh, allow them to stay here. And the plan is simple. They tell the king that, dear king, the only thing we want to have is we want to send the army of, our, of, the, of the Germans away, back home. No threat to you whatsoever, but we would like to invite here 200 peaceful merchants who have the idea of building a small trading town, doing business, 
and the lucrative part of the deal is that they will pay you tax, dear king, as have, however much you see fit. So he allowed these merchants <laughs> to come here and settle their small trading town in the shadow of the great hill. <clears throat> As the Germans come here, this actually puts a beginning to not only one town, but two. The upper town, this belongs to the nobility, and the lower town, now this is starting to belong to a new class rising. So in uh, the medieval society, basically there were three classes uh, that prevailed. We had the church, the clergy, who uh, commanded the word of God. We had the nobility, who ruled over everyone and everything. And then we had the majority of the population, the third, the peasants. The unfortunate ones whose role was to born into this life to be of servitude for the ruling classes. But these merchants who come here, they think differently. They don't like the way things are nowadays, that people are born to the class that they are in and they cannot change it. So they have come here seeking to build a world in which everyone gets to make up their own mind and gets to strive towards a better life. So in their fear of becoming obsolete, the nobility started telling the peasants and the pagans that these merchants who have come here are actually nothing but a simple group of thieves whose mission it is to get wealthy and rich at the expense of other people. So the locals, they start believing the nobility, calling these merchants thieves and pirates. And what do you think, what did they do with their, let's say, newfound reputation as the bad guys, as the villains? They embrace it. Yeah, what else is there to do? They embrace it. They choose Saint Nicholas, who in those days was the patron saint of sailors and thieves as their protector and start building their city nonetheless. So we have the nobility up there ruling, we have the merchants here, the thieves build, starting to build their own city, but all the while the locals, they actually are not very happy with their new roles as slave to these new intruders. Time goes on and some of these pagans, they start realizing that these two powers are actually not the same. Yeah. They represent different uh, ideas, different perspectives. And some of these locals start seeing the opportunities these merchants bring and they decide to join them. And together, the merchants and the locals, they have built this beautiful old town that you have strolled through, I don't know how many time times time already. Again, yeah. <laughs> but today we get to explore it from a new perspective. The house of painter Michael Sitto. Yeah. So basically Michael Sitto was uh, one of the most famous medieval painters. And uh, this is the house uh, he lived in. Uh, he ended up liking this place so much, uh, perhaps you as well, who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, he, that he wanted to stay here and live here. We'll have our own house with a plaque. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. He's talented. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he is, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> When was the last time you did a tour? Uh, about five weeks ago. Oh wow. <laughs> now we have the mobility up there, the merchants down here, they're starting to build the town. They realized that every town needs a reliable source of drinking water, yeah? Yeah. So that is why I'm about to tell you the one joke I always do. <laughs> well, well, well. What do we have here? <laughs> Kirsty's dad will appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Greetings to your dad. <laughs> Greetings, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and so they start uh, digging a well. And it is time to try the water. So they give this water a try. <laughs> so horrible that you have to poop, spit it out. <laughs> now, since uh, merchants, we know how to do business well. We have no idea how to fix complicated water tasting problems. We were forced to turn to the local monks, the wisest people in town, the ones who read, mm -hmm, write, oh -ho, and speak to God directly. They have a long discussion how to fix this problem when suddenly the smartest of the monks, Brother Albert, steps forth and declares, I have a solution. See a stray cat, you see it? <laughs> right. Yeah, I your guess. job is to pick this cat up. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Pick, it up, pick it up, bring it next to the well. <laughs> Christy, what do you do with a cat next to a well? Without any concern whatsoever, you throw the cat <laughs> inside the well. <laughs> because Brother Albert, he told us that cats improve water quality. <laughs> now, <laughs> right, okay. Smart one. And he was the smartest of the bunch. <laughs> now, I reckon uh, I had the same reaction as I saw your astonished faces to what? <laughs> but we have to understand, who were we in those days to yeah, question yeah. the divine wisdom of those yeah, monks? Yeah. Yeah. So, cats it was. <laughs> cats later, the whole city comes to a unanimous conclusion. Throwing living animals into our own water supply is not, not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> this is called the cat's well. Oh. But that's the reason you don't see any cats around the town. Yeah. <laughs> <I reckon. laughs>
Teach them how to say hello. Do you know it by now already? Tere. Tere. Ta tanam for thank you. Exactly. Tanam, yeah. yeah. We taught ourselves the basic. Very good. <laughs> yeah. It's the basics. The good manners you only need. Yeah. Tere. Hello. Yeah. Tanam. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So for us to understand where the name Reval comes from, we first have to go back to the year 1219, when the brave king of Denmark, <laughs> Voldemar the Second. Sounds like Voldemort. Manages to conquer the hill behind him. And after a victorious battle, the king wanted to provide reward for his men. So as the king now looked at the deer, and the deer looked at the king, they stood at each other like as if they were two lovers in full moon. Until the beast finally, of course, realized that the king is there to eat him. Yeah, so instead of a heart, he had a, a bow and an arrow. Yeah. So the beast here ran away, the king gave a proper chase as well, and after roaming around in the upper part for a few moments, the king finally managed to corner the deer to the edge of this very same cliff. The deer now has a chance to either be slaughtered by the hand of the king, or to take a look down at the depths below and take its own life. So, the deer looks down and thinks it is a scary fall. Looking at the king again, he realizes, well, this is half as scary. So the deer, he plunges into the air and falls down to the ground right over here, ending his own life, I'm afraid, but managing to grasp its freedom. <laughs> but he decides to honor this deer after this very same event to call these newly conquered lower lands after this animal, after this event. By combining two old Germanic words, he combines re, meaning a deer, and fall, meaning to fall, giving us the name Reval. Today you are not in Tallinn, today you are in Reval, Reval. the fall of a deer. Uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 1920 they gave this uh, city an official name Tallinn. Why they named it Tallinn was actually the reason that the locals in Estonian, they call this, this land Tani Linn, which is the Danish city. But Tani Linn abbreviated is Tallinn. Well, it just made it shorter, okay. more Estonian, compact-like. This is the widest street of the old town. Lai means wide. wide. This uh, is the widest okay. street of the old town. Okay, <laughs> it's quite, okay. It's quite wide, isn't it, for, the, for how the old town streets are? They're all very small. And exactly. Yeah. And it goes Relative. even wider when we cross the corner. Yes. But second, by the theatre. I think wide yeah. streets make it make it feel wealthier because the wider streets usually do kind of mean that. So it might be why we thought it. As I said before, <laughs> intuition. You have it well. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> because uh, because I'm going to talk about uh, later on in up. Uh, about the merchant houses, why they were so big inside and so forth. So this okay. room, this space, it actually means something as well. Uh, the Church of St. Olaf, built to show the ambition and success of these merchants. And behind this city wall stands a tower so high, and before that, the cover of the roof, it was of a bronze, so it had a golden tower oh, shining from a distance. So yeah. this church attracted a lot of wealth, but it also attracted uh, something else. When they decided to put a big metal cross on top, oh. lightning. Oh, and it got hit for 17 times. <laughs> Firstly, everybody believed that we have made God angry because we tried to get so close. And after it burned down twice, we realized there were laws of conductivity. Yeah. <laughs> so we decided to make the cross out of a different material and build the tower shorter, now being as high as 123 meters. This city theater now is actually one of the best preserved medieval merchant houses in this town. So a house this magnitude tells you one thing, that you have enough money to build it. Yeah. Yeah. And as these merchants became wealthier, started building bigger houses, the nobility, the rulers, they see these merchants building bigger houses than ourselves now. So they didn't feel good about this as well, again. So it was a good time to implement those good old taxes. Yeah, which were of course promised to the Danes. They were allowed to take. Exactly. So now the regulations say that the width of your house shall be taxed heavily. Then uh, they say that the height of your house will be taxed heavily uh, as well. And these merchants, they have built their house big. So they have to reshape their houses becoming ever so smaller and smaller and smaller. But when you're losing space, how do you find more space? Not only you go down, but you go in depth. Because the only thing that was taxed was the street side. Have you ever heard of the window tax? 
they decided to come up with a tax they called, in those days, the daylight tax. Which says that every sun ray that goes through your window will be taxed with a coin. The bigger your windows are, the more you have to pay. So that is why these windows are actually not original. These were not here. They were like up from the upper floors, you see. The way yeah. you go around tax is uh, by taking the tax at face value, glass or windows. So yeah. they realize doors are not windows, windows are not doors. So doors were non taxable. <laughs> so that is why they built their windows out of doors. Whenever you need daylight, you open up the door, and whenever you don't, I can only reckon how happy they were sticking their head outside in the evening. No tax for you. The white street is called the white because it's the widest. This is the longest street in the old town. Now, this is here is a guild. And why have I brought you in, uh, in front of a guild is that um, to follow up the merchant's house, the city theater building, yeah. is that they came up with different kinds of marketing tricks and maneuvers and ways how to better their environment. But they realized that the best way to do it is not by yourself trading from your own doorstep. The best way to do it is to join forces, uh, resources and merge into guilds. So that is why I brought you to one of the most important guilds in the old town and this is called the Brotherhood of the Blackheads. This here is Saint Maurici or Saint Mauritius. He was the first dark-skinned Roman legionnaire who in the third century had the courage and the faith, if you can call it, to start Christianizing people in Egypt. A thousand years goes by and young, uh, unmarried, bachelor merchants in this town, they look up to his uh, deeds uh, and hold it in high regard. So they merge into a guild to defend the town and after him they call themselves the Blackheads. Courageous, faithful as well. So that's where the name comes from. But these people themselves, as I said, they are young, unmarried, lots of time and money on their hands, but they have come together to, to defend the town. Things that come out the walls, yeah. next to the door. Yeah. So the Blackheads, they were also responsible for nighttime peace. So they <laughs> chained the streets from one side to the other, so no horses or no movement could be going on, so everybody could have a nice evening's rest. And okay. the second thing is that although the nobility ruled over these lands, it was the merchants who closed the door between the two cities and locked it. So no uh, a noble man or noble lady can come down and uh, be, what do you say, cause some ruckus here. <laughs> The noses that I had on the previous shoes, they were uh, of use as well. A fashion statement started by the nobility at the start of the 1200s. And as it grew, this uh, fashion, people started looking at it from different perspective. Material is expensive. So the more material you can put on your shoes, on your garments, the more wealthier you are. So yeah. this became a question of status. Okay. Yeah. So the longer your noses were, the more wealthier you were. Okay. And this fashion statement quickly grew into something ridiculous where the noses not only curled up to here But they also stretched all the way to the knee <laughs> So with straps like this similarly you can tie it down so that from a mile away people can see how much importance you bear It lasted about 200 years until an English king deemed it so ridiculous He started taxing these noses and then they faded away. He had a point Exactly. Aha! <laughs> nice! Nice, he had a point indeed! See what I did there? Yeah! Boom. Get it from my dad! Yeah! yeah. Nose is flapping around. You yeah. cannot do it. That doesn't look good. It's not practical. So they had to relearn how to walk. <laughs> now, is there any chance I can take your camera and film you? Of course, yeah. yeah. yeah you do. Well, I would like to now welcome you to the center of the street as I'm about to teach you how to walk like a proper fancy lord or lady. <laughs> and for this, uh, you take the lady's hand. Exactly, and in those days, actually, the way it was is that you place your hand underneath and the lady just puts it on top. Okay, this is the most this. polite way you can do it. If you cross fingers, go get a room. Uh, perhaps the light will be a, better, a bit better <laughs> than oh, you. Oh, videographer. Uh-huh, oh, it is. So, we had to relearn how to walk. So if we cannot do the heel and toe and there are heavy noses in the front side, the first thing we do is we raise our foot like a well-trained horse would. Mm -hmm. And as we touch the ground, the weight of the noses pulls down the toes first and then the heel. Yeah, so we go up, toe, heel, up, toe, heel. Not very hard, right? Second step. But you need to show how elegant you are in keeping your posture, your balance. And the best way to do it is to do it with your hands. So as graciously, as <laughs> elegant as you can, whilst walking with fine steps, Show me how you walk. While maintaining holding. Yes. Touching hands. Yes, so up toe heel, 
Up to heel. Up to heel. Up to heel. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And now my favorite part, the third part. Uh, this is the best, one of the best places I like to do it because it echoes a lot. So I would like to now, let's do it together so we wouldn't feel alone in this one. We let the people know in the early hours how we arrived at the town and this is by doing very descriptive sounds. Aha! Oho! Yes! Up to. <laughs> I'm not sure I've read this in the video. <laughs> you wow. have to, you have to. Woo. Beautiful. I'll give you a round of applause. <laughs> well done. Not, I, I think we are getting looked at for other reasons. <laughs> in those days. <laughs> Let's recap a few things. The merchants. They come here at the start of the 1200s. They're here with a different kind of a goal, to change the world, to bring prosperity and the opportunities to not only their lives, but to the lives of the people, well, in this land as well, in that sense, because this is where they wanted to start. It takes them around 200 years to build this city up from zero, from scratch, together with the people of the town, uh, with the, the locals. Their houses are becoming bigger. Uh, they hoist up the tallest building in the world. This is a, 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 a gateway between the east, east and the west. And now 200 years have finally passed and in, tw in 1417 they managed to now build this, the great guild. Now, what have we learned uh, from the front side of the house? What can you say for, for a house this big? Oh, it's very wide. Exactly. Big windows. Exactly. Oh. And high. Exactly. Yeah. So compare it in your mind to the city theater, the merchant's yeah. house, so in 1417, after creating this house, what it shows is that they have now the means and the, let's say, the, the will to build in a city they themselves built <coughs> whatever they wish, wherever they wish, however they wish. So they built the Great Kild as wide as two houses, as tall as a small church. Mm. It is the only uh, building that is built inwards because all the other buildings have to be built in one line. This is the rule again. Uh, they built it a meter inwards. Set back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But to top it off, the windows are our original size, so they built now windows bigger than the nobility's own doors. So as I said before, with the height of St. Olaf's Church, the windows here, the size of the house, was again a very polite way of showing your middle finger yeah. with grace. Yeah. <laughs> Letting them know that their time is over. And in 1417, they finally managed to get through. The nobility didn't, didn't have the attitude towards the merchants as someone here they are now a considerable state. Okay. They are creating change uh, okay. in the very world they are living in. Yeah. So they decide to stop taxing these merchants, give up the seat in the city council in the lower town. And so in 1417, Reval, after 200 years, finally becomes the city of the merchants. A uh, few things we can take from the past uh, and learn from the merchants is that uh, whatever you do in your life, do it with integrity. Do it with heart. If you yeah. make shoes that last you a lifetime, you're creating a value that lasts you a lifetime. Because this was a question of honor, not just finding the easiest ways to do it quickly and so that I can done and I can rest. Yeah. So whatever you do in your life, do it with heart. You never know where this energy leads. Mm -hmm. And second thing, whenever we have the chance to uh, enhance energies, yeah. like if you're happy about it, something, I'm very happy for you. Yeah. And I get the happiness as well. Yeah. And yeah. as we share, yeah. it spreads. It yeah. spreads, exactly. Better than Corona, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Better than Corona. Tenfold, hundredfold. Always a smile on your face with a <laughs> step on your, on your, on your feet. And uh, <laughs> voila. Perfect, perfect. Giddy up. <laughs> so, whenever you see archways uh, and doors that are not closed, you can go in. Because, uh, as the old town says, whenever there are doors open, you're welcome to join and have a look. Uh, this is the uh, Church of the Holy Spirit, the oldest sacrilege building in, uh, in Estonia. And the best part here is this huge clock, uh, made in the, built in the year 1684 by Christian Ackermann, a Dutch clockmaker, a master in its craft. Uh, the center of the, the circle and inside the center, everything is repainted, but the sides have still, again, the original coat of paint. Wow. Amazing. People built this world to last. And as I told Kirsty, or Kirsty, would you like to tell it yourself? How is it possible that this clock 
from the very start still shows the right time. Because it's got a little hatch, so any time it goes wrong or slow, they just stick their hand through and put it correct. Ah, and it's got that's little, what the little hatch is yeah. for. So with your own hands, you move hands of time, and voila, it shows the right time. <laughs> <laughs> a medieval, fully grown man was about this size. Do you want to demonstrate? I'm too tall. Go on. <laughs> As I said, you're a giant. I've never felt so tall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too tall for the doorway. Beautiful. Look how much those knees were bent. <laughs> Massive. <laughs> I don't know, they're doing something here, but if, if you can go to the right side, entering from the other side, it's a peaceful haven. Even if it's 10,000 people in the city, basically you're there alone because nobody knows to go there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if the gate is open, go there. If not, take the evening hours, climb uh, across the gate, yeah. and you'll be fine. <laughs> To the final story where our own Lady Kirsty <laughs> is going to be Thomas <laughs> performing and if you can just turn your camera around performing to the lot of these people who have all paid a ticket price to see and the, seagull. the tale of old Thomas <laughs> being performed live especially the seagull in the front seat take aim with a bow and arrow and their idea is to shoot down a statue of a parrot from on top of a pole and okay. whoever shot down the parrot first was declared the king of Mayfair, a hero for a year. Thomas decides to jump out of the crowd, take his bow, take his arrow, aim at the parrot and release the arrow. Okay, but only because it's not a real one. Yeah. <laughs> release the arrow and shoot the parrot down with the very first shot. An army of children dragging on your coats, asking Thomas, Thomas, do you have the time to tell your stories? And Thomas, as an old man, always says, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Time. Got all the time Ex in the world. Exactly. We're on lockdown, we've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> but every story comes to an end. At one point, our dear old Thomas, of course, he passes away. And now the children are aimlessly looking around the town, trying to find Thomas, asking, Thomas, have you seen Thomas? Have you seen Thomas? I haven't seen Thomas. Steve, have you seen Thomas? <laughs> no. And so, whenever children ask, Mommy, Daddy, have you seen Thomas? We tell them not to worry, but look at the top of the town hall. Because there, on top of the cold and sphere, there's a wind vane which turns around. So at the moment, we don't see it very well, but if we were to go to that side, we would see it perfectly. But up there stands Thomas guarding and protecting the citizens and children of Reval for now and forever. Ah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Thank you so much to our amazing Tallinn tour guide, Coit. Hello. <laughs> Look him up if you're in Tallinn. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Till the next time we'll see you around. Cheers. Just finished our guided tour with Coit and it was a three and a half hour tour. <laughs> so we're pretty hungry afterwards. So we've stopped here at Revelia in the Old Town main square for some five euro pizzas, which we've eaten most of. <laughs> Sitting in the spot. <laughs> Tell it. I don't think they want us to pay for the pizzas. Hello? Tell it. The main course himself, and for this matter, that's the king. <laughs> a very modern king, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have guns then. Very <laughs> much shotgun. <laughs> this tour starts in the medieval days, but ends up in the 2525. <laughs> so the king jumps on his horse, wah, and starts riding around. He looks to the left. Yeah. <laughs> the other left. Looks to the right. <laughs> The horse carrying another horse. Yeah. yeah. That every day. So, uh, oh, me, me. That's Hello. the roadrunner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Me, me. Now, Kirsty, do you think young men only have fighting on their minds? I don't know. Yeah, Craig, <laughs> do you agree? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you like what you've seen, please hit the like button and leave any comments. If you want to see more, don't forget to subscribe. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you on the next video.